please start, Ivan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Casey. And uh, I apologize for having joined so late today. <laughs> All the things. Uh, okay, so welcome everybody to lecture six. I'm Ivan Martí Vidal from University of uh, Valencia. And uh, well, this, if this talk would be related to all possible problems you would have, you could have with VLBI, I would leave the rest of the week just for me because <laughs> it's such a, such a, a painful and difficult technique. We all know that, that, we, that many, many, many different things can happen. But fortunately we have added this typical word at the beginning. So we will just focus on the problems that usually arise in, in, in any VLBI observation. Okay, so uh, I, I kind of arranged the different problems we might encounter in the, in the observations in three different types. Okay, so first we're going to discuss about the effect of bad gains. Okay, how they map into the image. Okay, what's the effect of, of having a, an incorrect or in, inaccurate gain in any or in any antenna or in a set of antennas and, and, and how the different kinds of gain errors map into the, into the images and ways to try to solve that, to address that, okay? Then we will talk about bad data because the problem may not be related just to the gains, but, but also to the data, okay? If the data is too noisy, the signal to noise ratio is too low. We may also have problems when trying to correct the, the, the gains using self-calibration. So we have to be very cautious about that. And last but not least, bad sources. So <laughs> the data could be okay, the calibration could be okay. But the sources themselves could have some properties that make their analysis troublesome. Okay, and then we have to think well what to do and how to how to configure the deconvolution algorithms and so on. So, so let's start from the beginning, the case of bad gains. Okay. So, and we start from the very very beginning, the very basics. Okay, this all, you all know. Okay, so I'm just gonna pass very fast through this. So as you all know, the true image brightness distribution is related to what we call the visibility function, okay, which is what the interferometer measures, okay. We measure samples of the visibility function, okay, uh, so that uh, we only have a, a finite coverage of the visibility function. We don't know the visibility function in the whole Fourier space. We only know it in particular points of, of the Fourier plane called coverage, okay. This is the UV coverage, a function that is a binary function. It's zero whatever we don't have baseline observing and, and is one, whatever we do have a baseline observing, okay? So this is a binary function that multiplies the visibility function. If we fully transform this, we get what we call the dirty image, okay? Which is related to the true image via the very famous convolution theorem, okay? So this ensures that us that the true image and the dirty image are related by this convolution with what we call dirty beam, okay? And the dirty beam is Nothing more, nothing less than the Fourier transform of the coverage, of the Fourier coverage, the UV coverage of our interferometer. So, so far, so good. We all know the, we all know this, but life is a little bit more complicated than this ideal world, okay? In, in real life, what we have is that, what we measure is not exactly the visibility function at that point of Fourier space where the baseline is observed. What we do measure is a, is a, is a corrupted version of the visibilities, okay? And this is corrupted by a function, okay, that we could call gain error, okay? Ideally, this gain error would be zero so that we, so that the visibilities, the true visibilities and the observed visibilities would be equal. But in the general case, this is not zero, okay? So we have either amplitude or phase, this is complex values, of course. We can have amplitude, phase, or both, combination of both things affecting the visibility function, okay? So in the end, if we do some maths out of this, the conclusion is quite interesting. So the image that we observe is not the dirty image, okay? What we observe is the convolution of the true image with another thing. Another thing that is not the dirty beam is another thing, is what we could call the true beam, okay? The beam that really is convolving the data because of the gain error function, okay? So actually this is the origin of all the ugly systematics and effects that we see in an image when we are cleaning it and we have gain problems, okay? The fact that the true image and the observed image, what we would call dirty image, but it's not exactly the dirty image, it's the observed image, is the convolution of the true image with two beams, okay? The sum of two beams, okay? One of them is the dirty beam, the one that we know, okay? And another one, which is added to the dirty beam is what we could call, let's, let's call it 
the game beam, okay? Just to be to be consistent with the rest of nomenclature, okay? So in the end, this game beam is, is this, is the Fourier transform of the coverage times the game function, okay? Oh, well, sorry, plus, yeah, exactly, times the game function. If this would be zero, of course, this would be zero, and the convolution would be with the fifth beam, okay? So in the end, what I wanna, what I wanna emphasize with all these maths is that the effect of a bad game in an antenna or in a set of antenna is a convolution-like effect in the image plane, okay? So something that is being multiplied in the Fourier space, of course, becomes convolved or convolved, sorry, in the image, in the image plane, okay? So what we have is that the, the, the point spread function that is convolving our data is not the point spread function that we use in the deconvolution. Both beams are different, okay? So the image is convolved with one thing and we deconvolve another thing. We deconvolve a beam that is different from the true beam, okay? So again, wrong antenna gains have a convolution-like effect in the image plane. The true convolving PSF, the one that really is convolving the image, and the one that we are computing from the UV coverage and using cleaning, these two beams are not equal, okay? And this introduces dynamic range limitations. And you may ask, what is dynamic range limitation? A dynamic range limitation is a limitation in the contrast of an image, okay? So the amount of contrast that you can retrieve from the, the convolution is limited, okay? If you have a very strong source and you have a very weak source close by, it doesn't matter how sensitive your interferometer is. If you are limited by dynamic range, you may not be able to see the weak source because of the presence of the strong source. Even if you have more than enough sensitivity to detect the weak source, but you are limited by contrast, not by sensitivity, okay? Uh, here you have a, a, a graphic example when, when, I, when I show this. So this is a simulation of uh, Westerbork, okay? An observation of a source. I think the declination, was, the declination was 30 degrees north, okay? And we have observed two sources, one which is a very strong one that is here, and the other one which is around here, it's very weak. We can't see this from the dirty image, okay? We need to deconvolve the beam first. So I have added an error, okay? A phase error in one of the Westerbork antennas. It's about 20 degrees of phase error in one antenna, which persists in time, okay? Uh, first, I'm gonna show uh, the result of cleaning with the data perfectly calibrated. So, so you clean this source and you are able to see the weak source here. Actually, you see it very well. It's very clear detection of the weak source. But now if I add the error, if I add the antenna error, look what happens. Okay, it's just adding 20, 20 degrees phase in one of the Western board antennas, only one of them. And the limitations that we get in dynamic range are enough to just wipe out the signal from the weak source. Okay, as you can see, these, these, uh, these differences here are the differences between the PSF that I have used in the deconvolution and the true PSF that was convolving the data, okay, which was multiplied by this G function, okay. So uh, now, how do these, these Gs behave, okay? So as a function of the kind of gain error that we have, we have different effects in the image plane, different, different convolution artifacts, okay? Can I show you a couple of examples that, that we all know already? So I think I'm wasting time explaining this. So the first is the amplitude-like effects, okay? So if, you, if, the gain, if the gain error function G is real value, so you only have amplitude errors, okay, then the distribution of this is, is even in Fourier space. And because of the Fourier transform of a even function is even as well, the residuals are even. That means that the PS, this error PSF is even, okay? And then the residuals that you get here, the convolution-like residuals, okay? Here you see the dirty image of, uh, of a Westerbork simulated observation, and here you have the residuals after cleaning, okay? And as you can see, this is a convolution-like effect. So the same residuals that you see in this source are also around this source. This is the same. It's a convolution-like effect. These amplitude errors produce uh, symmetric or even, evenly distributed residuals around the sources. Okay, so you see there's a kind of positive ring here. Then you have a negative. Then you have a positive, and these are distributed symmetrically with respect to any point source that you have in the image. In the case, in this case, we only have two sources. You have the same artifacts around each one of these sources and they are symmetric, okay? If on the other hand, you have a phase error uh, and the phase is, uh, is not very large, okay? If, it, if it's uh, rather small, then this is pure imaginary at the first approximation, okay? And odd because of the Hermitian uh, properties of Fourier space. Then 
this, the, the residuals will be odd, will be just the opposite as with an amplitude error. So as you can see here, the residuals after, after adding a phase error in, in one of the Westerbork antennas, you have here a positive residual and at the same distance from the source, you have a negative. Okay, so you see this distribution is anti-symmetric. Okay, this is, you have anti-symmetry. This can help you in some simple situations to try to guess which kind of error is affecting your image just by looking at the distribution of the residual in the image, okay? Uh, now I would like to ask, uh, uh, ask you to answer a question. So this is a quiz, okay? So just to, 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 to check how is your Fourier vision, okay? And now if this works, now Ilse could launch a, a poll where you have to select which uh, from all these antenna distribution, which is the EBM, as you all know, okay? So which uh, baseline and which kind of gain do you think is affecting this, is producing these systematic residuals here? You think it would be a Jodelbank Onsala amplitude gain, for instance? Jodelbank Robledo? Or yeah, which kind of which kind of uh, baseline and, and gain error you think is producing this? Do we give some time for the answer or you say? Well, I, I will give I will give a minute a minute. <laughs> okay. I hope we don't but there is also the time, time pressure. <laughs> Yeah, people can also only submit the, quest, uh, the answers when all the questions have been asked. So we've got slide 10 and slide 11, but then the last question. Okay, so just oh, answer slide. Slide, slide 10. Yeah, only, this, uh, only the first slide. Okay? Yes, slide 10. Okay. So we will know, we will know the answer. Maybe after the talk. <laughs> yeah, there's. Somebody I, says that they cannot submit. I I can see answers dropping in now, uh, but people okay. have to think of an answer for the, the next one as well. So if now okay. we can only look at. Yeah, we could we could maybe reveal reveal the truth here, or just give or just just give some information. Well, you see that the source was here at the, at the middle. Okay, so the residuals seem symmetric, right? You have negative, positive, so these are symmetric. And looking at the spatial frequency here, one would say that a long baseline should be introducing this, okay? Because the spatial frequencies corresponding to this are, are high spatial frequencies. So that means that the baseline should be long. So that, that, that's all I can say, okay? Now, next question. It's uh, the, same, the same array, but now the residuals look very, 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 very different. So what do you think is happening can, excuse me, can everybody yes. see the poll still? Because I, I lost the vision of the poll, but perhaps. Oh. oh, I can still, I've still got it live. Yes, I, I see people answering yes. So, okay, that's that's very good. Okay, so. so because apparently you, you need, people need to see all the, all the questions before they can do submit. Oh, that's a limitation in the poll, in the polling system, right? Yeah, I well, but, but we, we will wait until you have finished all the questions and then everybody can, okay, we will see okay. the answers all together. Okay. So now it's very different. Yeah, now it looks, it looks anti-symmetric. It, it looks like an odd distribution, not even distribution, right? And look at the spatial frequencies. Okay, look at the scales of the, of the residuals. This should be a rather short baseline, right? Okay, so I'd rather move to the next slide because we are short in time as always. Well, real life is a lot more complicated, okay? <laughs> in real life, you don't have just one or the other. You have combination of everything, amplitude, phase error from different baselines, antennas, times, whatever, okay? Life is very complicated in real life. <laughs> uh, so what do we do in these situations? How can we identify the bad uh, gains, uh, the, the antennas with bad gains? Okay, one easy way is actually to take advantage of the spatial frequency distribution in the residuals. So actually, if you take this image, this residual image, and you compute the inverse Fourier transform of it, what you get is this, okay? This is the inverse Fourier transform of this image. So basically what we have is that uh, the only signals that we get from the residuals are, are of course located in the spatial frequencies of the gridded visibilities, okay? So we only have a special information about the ba of, on, on, of the baselines that we're observing. And as you can see here in this plot, there are some 
base lines that are especially illuminated in this plot. So you have an extra power in this baseline. This is actually the information that couldn't be decomposed. Okay, so, so what remains here in the residual actually belongs to these baselines. So this is the difference between the true PSF and the PSF used in the deconvolution. These are the special frequencies that have an extra power in the true PSF and not in the PSF used in the deconvolution. Okay, and there is a, a, has a task actually called check res, which is a pretty old task. I don't guarantee it to work in the latest CASA versions, definitely not in CASA 6. And you can retrieve from the Nordic Alma Regional Center node that actually takes advantage of this. So what it does is to compute the Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform of the residuals and overplot the baselines of the antennas that you select. So you just choose an antenna and it will overplot all baselines to that antenna. And that can help you locate the responsible antenna or set of antennas that is producing this extra power in the special frequencies of the residual image, okay? That's one way to do this. There's another more classical way, which is using the plot MS task that was uh, described by Benito yesterday, okay? Uh, here I show you a couple of examples of the kind of plots that you can use to, to, to find out these problematic uh, gains, okay? One of them would be to plot the amplitude of the residual visibilities, okay? So look at the column here, okay? It's, it's set to corrected model minus, uh, cor uh, sorry, corrected minus model vector that means vector subtraction or coherent subtraction of the corrected column minus the model column so in principle this subtraction should produce a pure Rayleigh distribution of amplitudes which means that the amplitude should be around zero actually around the rms of the of the baseline uh, error of the baseline noise sorry and as you can see here there are a few outliers we don't follow this distribution here okay so for, uh, uh, now just selecting a region uh, around each one of these colors and just pressing this magnifying glass, which is the locate button, you could identify the responsible baselines that are off of the model, okay? Just by plotting the amplitude of this uh, coherent subtraction of corrected column minus model. Another plot that can be useful, but can have problems if your source has a rich structure and you have nulls in Fourier space, but if that's not the case, this is also useful, is to plot the phase of the ratio of visibilities over model because when you divide the model by the uh, sorry the visibilities by the model what you do is a kind of the convolution of the source using the source itself okay so what remains after this ratio should be zero phase for all visibilities and a constant amplitude okay for all visibilities for all visi for all uh, points in uv space okay and as you can see here we have zero phase for a good fraction of the visible of the baselines, but there are all other baselines that are offset in phase. Okay, these small phases of 10 degrees minus 10 degrees that you see in some baselines are produced by differences between the PSF used in the deconvolution and the true PSF. Okay, so these are two ways that, of course, there are more combinations, but I, I, I just tell you the, the two, what I think is, is are the two. Uh, uh, most interesting ones or the, or the best ones to check for uh, outliers in the residual visibilities, okay? So that would tell you about the problems in the gains. So what do we do when we find these problems in the data? We can do two things. One is the Richman approach, which is just plug the data, okay? You forget about them. If you have many antennas, you can do this. The other one is the Poorman approach, which is usually the case in VLBI. You can try to, to keep them Okay, and you can to, to, to sanitize the data, okay, by using self-calibration. Self-calibration is just deriving antenna gains that reproduce or minimize the difference between uh, visibilities and model, which is uh, mathematically similar to just minimize this extra power that you see in these pixels here, okay, so that the residuals become more Gaussian-like, more noise-like, okay. So self-calibration and iterative hybrid imaging would be the answer, okay. We, we use this to correct these bad gains. This is a powerful tool, very, very powerful tool, but uh, uh, as all we know, a great power comes with great responsibility, okay? So, so self-calibration is very powerful, but you have to use it with a lot of caution. And I mean, really a lot of caution because you can cause very odd things to your data if you are not cautious enough. And that brings us to the next, uh, the next kind of problems. It's the bad data. And you know, bad data is worse than no data at all. So, so don't play with bad data too much because you may end up arriving to completely wrong conclusions, okay? 
what happens? What do I mean by bad data? I mean noisy data, okay? Noisy, no, data that are too noisy in order to be used in a self-calibration, okay? So uh, in, in principle, if the calibration is correct, the real and imaginary parts of the visibilities have Gaussian noise that is uncorrelated between them. So real part has its own noise, imaginary part has its own noise, and both are uncorrelated. This is in the ideal world that the calibration is correct. And of course, if you translate this to amplitude and phases, you get completely different things. The noise is not Gaussian anymore, and you have correlations, okay? So, so working in this space is very different than working in this space. The problem is that self-calibration works in this space, the space that's right, amplitude and phases, where the Gaussian is, where the noise is not Gaussian and you have correlations. And these correlations can cause a lot of trouble, okay? Actually, this comes, this brings us to the next and last uh, uh, quiz question. So that's the third question in the poll. Okay, so here you have a distribution of the, uh, this is time evolution of the visibilities of a given baseline. We are observing a point source, okay? And this is what we get in a given baseline of our interferometer. And now the question is that we are observing a, a, a source which has a given flux, okay? We have here flux one, flux two, and flux three. Now the question is, which flux do you think is the right flux of the source? By looking at, at the amplitudes and phases, looking at the visibility plots here, what do you think is the right flux density of the source? So do we give maybe 20 seconds, 15 seconds to think? Yes, yes, until <laughs> now 20 seconds. I'm very curious to see the answer to this. It's almost equal. It's moving. Well, I have a slight preference for the bottom red line now. So people are still voting. I still see numbers trickling in. Okay, yeah, now there was a large increase. Well, 10 more seconds. And then five, four, three, three two, two, one. Four. Closing votes. Yes. End poll. End of votation. Uh, oh, oh, here are the results. Okay, yes, this one was correct. You this one was correct, yeah. yes. Could we, you maybe go back to the slide that you referred to when you discussed them? Yeah. Uh, shall I come back then? Yeah, yeah, just quickly go to slide 10 so that Oops. people who didn't, oh, didn't get oh, it oh, right oh. understand why. Okay, so Let's come back to the poll. So you see the poll here? No, we just see a black box hovering. Around. Okay, okay. So slide 10. So the answer was Shanghai Robledo amplitude gain. So if you look at the baselines here, here you have the antenna locations, okay? Uh, all options that have an amplitude gain, which is this one and this one, are very different in baseline length. So Jodo Bank Onsala is a very short uh, baseline, which produces very low spatial frequency signal in the residuals, okay? So that we would need to have a very wide uh, residual, okay? Not a very, not a very uh, high resolution or high spatial frequency one, but a very low spatial frequency one, okay? So the only option left was Shanghai Robledo, which is the, 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 the longest, the, or one of the longest baselines that we have here in the east-west direction, actually which is where we actually see the structure of the residual, okay? So that's the reason, okay? It's amplitude because it's, uh, it's uh, evenly spaced with respect to the source location. And it's a long baseline because in units of the, of the synthesized beam, which is, all, which is actually of the order of the size of, this, of these waves, okay, tells us that it's coming from a very long baseline, okay? I don't know if I explained enough or uh, we may need some extra discussion. We can discuss about this in the if, question. If people have questions, they can then put it in the, yeah, in the yeah, question box. So the, the second one was uh, Jodrell Bank Westerbork phase gain. So obviously it was a phase gain because the source was here. So the residuals are anti-symmetric. It means a phase gain. Okay. And the baseline now is, is short. Okay. Or it's, uh, well, we have actually other waves here, but the one that is dominating has a very low spatial frequency, which means that it's a short baseline. Okay. And the only one that matches from all these four, uh, from all these four uh, options is actually the general bank Westerbork phase gain. Okay, that's, uh, that's it. Now, if we come to this uh, slide. 
So the answer is actually flux one. Okay, it's uh, very uh, <laughs> it's very tricky. Huh? I've seen I've seen people self calibrating and fighting to the data until they would bring the the recovered flux density to the green level, but that's not the wise thing to do because you always have to look at the noise in the phases. Okay, it's not only the noise in the amplitudes but also the noise in the phases what tells you whether you can recover the whole flux or not. Okay, so this this observation is dominated by noise not by the flux of the source. So a good fraction of the signal here in the amplitudes is due to noise, okay? The, the source only contributes a very tiny fraction here. And the way we know it is because the phases are very, very noisy, okay? That's, uh, that's something that, well, we have to learn by trying, okay? And by, and by, and by, by playing. Actually, the danger, the danger of trying to put the flux into the, uh, into the green uh, uh, level is that we are generating fake noise. We are generating spurious signal from self-calibration, okay? There was a paper a long time ago, actually a very long time ago, and now I realize, oh my, I'm getting very old, where we actually studied the amount of spurious flux density that you can get when self-calibrating noisy data. And the results were awesome. So you can recover a good fraction of the RMS noise, which is the green line here, Okay, you can recover a good fraction of the green line of a spurious flux. So this is just noise converted into signal, which is a function of the integration time of the self-cal solution and the number of antennas. Okay, so for the case of very uh, low number of antennas, let's say nine or 10 for the VLBA, just using an integration time of a few seconds per self-cal solution can, bring, can originate or create half of the RMS noise. So you can basically recover a, a source like the red one just from pure noise. There's no problem. Even with the VLBA, you will even having 10 antennas. So you have to be very, very cautious. Okay, this would be the equation that gives you a rough estimate of, of the amount of flux that you can recover from noise. And just to give you a graphical example of this, which I think is very fun, let's take a, a, an EVN observation. This is a simulation of the EVN observation uh, at uh, of a source uh, with 30 degrees declination, observing just noise. So I have just simulated pure random noise, no source at all, okay, during six hours. And now I have introduced a model. Imagine I was observing a gravitational lens and I have a nice image in the optical. I want to recover that in radio and I start to put windows and self-calibrating, okay? In the end, I arrive to something like this, okay? Look at the, at the, at the dynamic range that we are getting, okay? So, so we are uh, having a peak of, let's say, 0 0.05 Janskis per beam here. Whereas the RMS is of the order of, of a millijansky. Okay, so we have a dynamic range of about uh, 50, 50, just from pure noise. Okay, and uh, I have a nice gravitational lens shape here. And actually what I was, what I was trying to recover was a pirate. Yeah, you, you see here the smile and the eye and the other eye here. Okay, so, so you can recover a pirate just from pure noise, just using self-calibration. So that's what I mean when I say that great power comes with great responsibility. We have to use self-calibration with a lot of caution, okay? Now, last but not least, bad sources. You can, well, Ivan, what do you mean by bad sources? Okay, even if the data is correct, the way you treat it can also produce systematics, okay? Uh, one of them, which, which happens when you, if your field is very wild and you have many sources or you have a very large source, okay, is, is, is mirroring effects, okay? So, so you can produce uh, smearing effects by, by, by uh, averaging your data, either in time or in frequency. What happens is that basically you have a convolution-like of operation in, in Fourier space. You are substituting tracks by points because you're averaging in time, okay? So a track of a, base, a baseline track, you are just collapsing it into a single point where you average in time, okay? This is a kind of convolution-like effect in Fourier space that maps into a product, product-like or multiplication-like effect the image plane, which basically is mirrors out any signal far from the phase center of your correlation, okay? Just to give you an idea of this, of the, the, uh, the importance of this effect, it limits the field of view in arc seconds by this amount, okay? So for, a, for baselines, which are transatlantic, let's say 10,000 kilometers, you have just, just using 11 seconds of time, of time uh, sorry, one second of time averaging limits the field of view to 11 arc seconds. Or if you use, uh, you have observations at one gigahertz bandwidth or at 50, 12 megahertz bandwidth and you collapse everything into one 
channel when you clean, you are basically limiting your field of view to five, to five arcseconds per megahertz. So even even much much smaller, if you have a wide band, imagine that's that's amazing. It's terrible. Okay, the field of view is very very much limited. Okay, so actually one way to avoid this uh, this bandwidth smearing, if you have a very wide band observation, is to clean in what we call multi frequency synthesis mode, where, where instead of collapsing the visibilities radially to one point per visibility, what we do is to make a, to perform a tailored expansion of of the of the source uh, distribution or reprojecting each visibility in its right place in UV space in UV space to try to minimize this. Okay, these are the different approaches or different strategies that we can use. And just to finish, here I show you an example where we see graphically what happens when you observe a source with a very wide bandwidth. Okay, and the source has spectral uh, spectral effects. So you have a spectral effects in the source. Okay, I have simulated. A core jet structure where the core has a flat spectrum, and this jet extension, the point here towards the northwest, uh, has a steep spectrum. This is typical in BLBI. It's an AGM, okay? It's an AGM jet with an optically thick core, okay? But if the, if the fractional bandwidth is wide enough, it can happen that if you deconvolve without taking into account this spectral dependence, you end up having an image which is very noisy and very much limited by dynamic range. Which would be the red contours. Okay, the red contours are very noisy. Okay, you are barely recovering the two components with a lot of noise around. Okay, now if you tell Clean to account for possible spectral dependence of the source components, which is again is the called multi frequency synthesis clean cleaning mode. Okay, which is implemented in CASA, you end up having the white contours. Okay, the contour levels are the same. I have set exactly the same contour levels for the red. And for the white, the only difference is that the white image is clean with this MFS mode, okay, that allows you to take into account possible spectral effects in your sources. This may become especially important in, in modern VLBI arrays where you have wide fractional bandwidth. So we may start uh, to see these effects of the spectral uh, structures of the sources, and we may start the need of using this multi frequency synthesis. Uh, cleaning mode in VLBI in, uh, <laughs> in in many cases, okay? And I think that's everything I have. So so this is the summary. Images are limited by UV coverage and by antenna gains, okay? And both have convolution-like effects, okay? Both produce their own PSFs in the image, okay? The UV coverage and the gain error function, okay? This also introduces its own PSF into the image, okay? Which produces uh, limitations in the dynamic range of the images. If there is an incorrect calibration, it is it is possible, fortunately, it's possible to identify the bad gains from the residuals. Okay, either Fourier transforming the residuals and trying to find out where the special frequencies where, you, where we have higher power in the in the residuals is check res task uh, for CASA that you can download. Uh, it's an old task, okay? So I don't ensure it to, to work. But if you are interested, I could upload a, an updated version of that task into the wiki. If you like the task, or if you like the idea, okay? I could I could, uh, I could could update it and upload it. And also, you can also check the residual visibilities using the plot MS tab, uh, task, uh, task, sorry. And you have different combinations here. Either you can, either you can plot the data over a model uh, and look for the phases and constant amplitudes, or the coherent, uh, subtraction of a model from the data and then look for the amplitudes not for the phases but you can only look for the amplitudes if you do that if you do this, if you do this coherent subtraction okay once bad data are identified we can correct them with self calibration but again remember if the data are too noisy you may not have the chance to do this okay otherwise you will run into severe problems okay you will introduce spurious sources into your system and even if the data are perfectly calibrated, you can still see, you can still introduce artifacts, okay? If you perform too heavy averaging or you clean in a mode that does not account for possible peculiarities in the source distribution, for instance, spectral effects in the source. And that's it. Uh, the, the typical slide to thank our sponsors and thanks also to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. This was a spectacular talk. I, oh, I really enjoyed it very much. So I 
there is already two questions in the Q and A box, and I presume that there might be more questions coming in through Mattermost. I start with the first one from Miguel Perez Torres. What are the assumed frequency and bandwidth in the simulated core jet structure of the last slide? Ah, okay. So, so it was uh, half a gigahertz coverage. In, if I remember well, what C band? I can I can share the scripts so you can re, re, uh, reconstruct the images if you like. Uh, so imagine just having zero and minus one, just half a gigahertz over five gigahertz, okay, in band C, and having half a gigahertz wide, which is possible nowadays with the EVM, right? With the EVM, you can observe with this spectral configuration, and you see that you start to see effects of source uh, of source spectral uh, of, of the source spectrum in the clean. Do you think that with the future brand uh, receivers, which would be really a number of gigahertz, that you, you would also need to use the, the, the end terms parameter in T-Clean? Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, this was already using these end terms. I was setting end terms to two in order to fit for the, uh, for okay. the stop side. Uh, for, for, sorry, for the, for the image I didn't at, see a, at a fiducial frequency plus the, the first Taylor term. Okay. Then there is a second question from Carolina Casadillo. Regarding your warning in self-calibration and the example you gave with the pirate, what about if you have observed the source at two frequencies and at the highest frequency you don't see it, as in your case of noise dominated, would you trust the user model you get from the lower frequency and then self-calibrate in phase using a longer integration time? That's would you that's a, that's a very good question. A very good question. What I would do is to uh, maybe make a make a, a, an analysis uh, similar to the one that was done here, for which we basically took a data set and applied self calibration with different integration times. Okay, and then we saw how the recovered flux was decreasing with integration time. If you see that as you as you increase the integration time, you tend to a constant. I mean, it, you saturate. Your, your self called uh, recovered flux, then you could model this as a way of saying that this is the true flux, okay, which is independent of the, of the solid solution. Okay? Whereas if you use too short integration times, you're introducing a spurious flux to your reals, to the real flux. Okay? There are actually in this paper, I think there are, there are a couple of tests or, or, or uh, a couple of uh, suggested tests that you can do to the data in order to check whether you have a, a real signal that you can decoupled from the self callous spurious flux. So I would suggest to make a, in that case, which is a very critical one, I would suggest to make some testing to be sure how much of that signal you would trust and how much you could assign to, to effects of self calibration. Okay, that seems, that seems a clear answer. Uh, then there is, I see, uh, yes, the Carolina said thanks. So I think also to her, it was clear. Then we have another question from E. Yoon. How often does VLBI observations have baseline-based errors, in brackets, additive errors? Oh, well, this I haven't mentioned. This is, <laughs> yes, well, uh, these are non, what we also call non-closing errors, okay? That's, that's a very wild area of uh, VLBI, okay? Uh, I would say that for a standard arrays like the EVM, where the geodetic uh, locations of the antennas and the, and the correlation procedures so, have been so much tested and commissioned, baseline-based errors should be minimum, if any. So, so uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't care much of this kind of errors for a race like the EVM. For more state-of-the-art race, that can be another matter okay, of discussion. But uh, yeah, for the for the EVN, I think they would be well. Maybe Benito, Benito, or Ilse, or whoever is working actually at the level of uh, being at the office close to the correlator can can give you more precise information. But I don't think it, it's 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 a big issue. Benito, if you are there, if you want to add something, please do. Yeah, as far as you know, we'll say the same as Ivan already mentioned. I think, or at least not in the general case, you wouldn't expect. One. Yeah, we had a brief discussion about it this morning, and uh, I think it was I think it was Michael Janssen who mentioned this that for uh, arrays like the EVM and the baseline-based errors are basically negligible, 
But if you have an array like the Event Horizon Telescope, where you have a really sensitive central system like the alma faced array, then it's something you need to be aware of that might be an issue. Okay, so we are looking still for more questions. Um, see, all three in the Q&A box have been answered. Yep, I don't see any. Matter most, there is, there is a number of compliments <laughs> for, for the talk, but, but no more questions. Well, if, well, people may always put their questions uh, if, when they come later on uh, in, the, in the matter most box. But then I, I suggest to, to take a short break and, re, and start again at 14.30 UT for, for the talk about, indeed, about uh, the Jupyter Notebook processing. Is that okay? Yeah, sounds like a plan. So everybody can okay. grab themselves a drink or a snack. Yeah, thank you again, Ivan, for the very nice talk. Thank you to you. It was very nice. And uh, the polls were excellent. I think it's <laughs> yeah, very what nice. Fun, what fun. <laughs> yeah, the last one was a tricky question. Huh? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> you could see that there was, there was the other ones had a clear preference. You could clearly see that most of the people had it right. The last one. Yeah, yes. It's, uh, and it's tricky because you start to self-calibrate because you trust that you could reach that level and then you introduce the spurious noise. So, wow, it's very dangerous. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I, I see that your office mate is, is watching. Is, oh. Yeah, actually, yes, we have uh, infinite, infinite screens now. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw on the, on the MetaMost that people were calculating the distance between you and the Zoom center as about 1500 kilometers because the delay in his slide changing and user slide changing was a few seconds. <laughs> Experts. Yes. Okay. I will go and get a tea. Yep. Bye. Well, I, I continue here. Bye. <laughs>